me now is Tom Fitton. He's the president of Judicial Watch, the author of A Republic Under Assault, and he's on the phone. Hello, Tom. Good to have you with us, sir. Hey, Vince. Good to be with you again. Thank you. I want to, I want to start with you on uh, yet another assassination attempt on President Trump. The left, of course, is blaming him for this, saying, well, he, he got what was coming to him. Uh, that's That's basically been the tenor of all of the coverage uh, since then. Um, what do you make of it? How is it possible that the Secret Service yet again has allowed a gunman to get this close to Donald Trump? I think it's willful negligence. Uh, they've made a political decision to deny him the full level of protection, uh, despite him being previously targeted for assassination, despite uh, the risks that he faces uniquely as a candidate and, and a target of a foreign um, government, the Iranians. Uh, it, there's no excuse. And when something happens that's unexplainable by a government agency, you know what you should think about? It's politics. It's just pure politics. And it's dangerous politics. Is, as you highlight, the left has crossed yet another Rubicon in terms of democratic norms, uh, basically saying, well, you know, if you get killed and you're our opponent, it's you, you're to blame which, of course, necessarily encourages more attacks. Oh. These are dangerous times, uh, you know, for our country because, you know, these failures by the Secret Service, in my view, encourage additional attacks because others think, well, maybe I can accomplish my goal of ending Trump's life. And uh, my gosh, I just hope we get through the election with Trump being alive. I, uh, one of the areas that I'm interested in getting answers to in terms of this latest assassination attempt is how does this guy know that Donald Trump is going to go to that golf course? And and to what extent was he camping out, for instance, on a routine basis with the hope that Trump might show up at that golf course? I just don't have the answer to those questions. One would think that if they were able to track his cell phone data to demonstrate he was there for 12 straight hours waiting for Trump, why aren't we seeing cell phone data from him for weeks past to let us know what was his pattern? How how frequently was he attempting this? What What are you looking for here, Tom? Well, I'm looking for, in addition to the fair questions you raise, is who knew what and when about this guy? Yes. And we had the Wall Street Journal report, the town hall report about folks in Ukraine who were very much aware of him. And my, my guess is, based on my experience understanding the way CIA works, pretty much any American uh, operating in Ukraine fighting that war would be on the CIA's radar. And they wouldn't be doing their job if they weren't tracking Americans in another country fighting a war, especially when one like was happening in Ukraine. Certainly the FBI, he should have been on the FBI's radar similarly. So, you know, my question is, what do they know about this guy and when? And uh, why wasn't he tracked, uh, given the various statements he was making to for anyone who would listen, that his enemies needed to die? Yes. Uh, frequently. And that and that seems to have informed, uh, to the extent that we can establish a rationale, his decision to try and take target Trump. He was angry at him about his Ukraine positions. He expressed on social media earlier this year that he supports Joe Biden because he thinks he, quote, defends democracy. Meanwhile, he was using the same White House talking points saying that Donald Trump is a threat to democracy. I've noticed the press has not shared those social media posts because they undermine their party's uh, uh, power. But uh, he, he's been pretty public about this, hasn't he, Tom? Yes, uh, remarkably public. And on top of that, I, you know, you're asking questions about the second assassination attempt. Yeah. We're still in full cover-up mode on the first assassination attempt. Uh, we haven't yet to receive any documents under FOIA from the Secret Service and FBI. They're so- citing ongoing law enforcement investigations as as an excuse, not really a reason to withhold the information from us and the American people. And it's been, you know, three, was it now three weeks? Not that long. Yeah. It was was, was a short while ago. It was was July 13th, right? When uh, we got the the first one. Oh, two months. Excuse me. Two months. I was thinking three months. It's two months. Yeah. And now August 5th, September 15th, that is uh, uh, yet again. And those are just the ones we know about, Tom. I said earlier this week, we're, we're just publicly aware of these assassination attempts. I have no idea how frequently this occurs. And the other big issue is the Secret Service, right? And, you know, besides the politics, it's the competence and whether the agency is functional in terms of it's able to perform its core mission. And we, we had these documents come out 
uh, from Judicial Watch's litigation showing their DEI obsession. And what they're encouraging people to do in these trainings is to report on each other. If they, if they, if they um, say the wrong thing, even object to DEI uh, could uh, be result in a discrimination complaint. So what, what a nightmare agency over there. And of course, Trump, I mean, of course, Biden let his dogs attack 25 agents. Uh, yeah. And of so course, you can be, where's the leadership when that happened? So you can be fired for a DEI violation, but if you let a sniper get on a roof and shoot Donald Trump, uh, very few people are held accountable. Right. And we don't even know who to hold accountable there and, and why, because they're hiding the information. I mean, this is an emer- this is an emergency. Right now, we can presume the Secret Service can't protect any of their protectees. There's no evidence they can. They failed twice with Trump. Why would Biden, to be fair, be any more confident or Kamala or Waltz or J.D. Vance or the former presidents who are protectees? They're all at risk. This is an emergency. We should treat it as an emergency. Deploy every asset necessary. Deploy the military if necessary to protect these men so, and women. So think, it's unacceptable, this risk so Tom, in our country. Tom, as, as a guy who who's really spends your life digging into what the government knows or doesn't know and what, what documents they're hiding from the rest of us, um, I'm, I'm curious about your reaction to Senator uh, Richard Blumenthal this week. I want to play some audio from him. He, he's been saying a couple times now to the media that he's furious at DHS for stonewalling him uh, from information about the the uh, Butler, Pennsylvania attempted assassination on Donald Trump. Take a listen to this. I am reaching the point of total outrage because the response from the Department of Homeland Security has been totally lacking. In fact, I think it's tantamount to stonewalling in many respects. If necessary, I'll certainly support a subpoena. What do you read from that? What, why is Richard Blumenthal saying this? This is unusual. Well, you know, I talk about the politics, but the politics also works on behalf of public accountability to sense these men and women recognize uh, they're uh, there for the grace of God go them, right? And personal security and for a politician is very important, and it's very direct when they see another politician almost lose their life, uh, or uh, now in this case twice. Yeah. Uh, and, and they recognize that, you know, m- maybe even though we've been playing games with Secret serv- Service protection, Maybe it's not the games that are the problem, that the way the agency is being run is the problem, and it means that everyone is at risk. I'm hoping. Yeah, I'm hoping, too. I'm, I'm hoping that his, uh, his quest for some answers here uh, helps the rest of us get them. Okay, let me, uh, move, right. let me move on to uh, uh, another issue with you. Springfield, Ohio, um, a much maligned Springfield, Ohio. The left has tried to mock the citizens of that town for their concern about what's happened to it. Um, you've been digging in, trying to get some answers. What has Judicial Watch discovered? Well, we got this curious document from the spring. Her cat went missing, but she blamed her Haitian neighbors. Let me pause. Let me pause for a second. Hey, Tom, Tom, in her backyard and thought that might. Hey, Tom, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we, the audience didn't hear much of what you just said. Your phone broke up, but just take it from the top. Oh, Okay. Yeah, we got we received from the Springfield County, the Springfield uh, Police Department in Ohio, a uh, police report taken a woman who accused her Haitian neighbors, perhaps, of taking her cat who'd gone missing. It was kind of an odd, uh, an odd report because she said she found a piece of meat in the backyard, thought it might be part of her cat, and she wanted to put in the, in the refrigerator and the freezer and save it for cremation. Wow. Uh, subsequently, suppose you know other reports and the and the cover letter they sent to us said, "Oh, the cat was found safe and sound after all." What's interesting is this shows that someone was calling, however unfairly, about Haitians in this regard. And the question is, were there other calls like that? This is the only document we got, and um, you know we're asking questions of the city manager as yes. well. So you know, in the end, the question remains. Why were 20,000 or however many Haitians placed in this in the middle of Ohio by the Biden administration? So this is at least as far as I can remember, the second such police call that I'm aware of in Springfield, Ohio, where you had a resident raising a concern about an animal being uh, seized up by some of the Haitian migrants. And um, that that we were told at the outset that no such calls existed. In fact, that was a feature of I'm pretty sure that was David Muir's 
quote, fact check during the ABC debate. No, there were no such calls or anything like this. It turns out that was a lie. You have uh, evidence that there was a call like this. Again, it sounds like the story ended well, that she found her cat, according to the Wall Street Journal digging in on this. Uh, but we've been lied to about whether or not the cops did receive calls to this effect. Right. And, you know, and J.D. Vance, who's a senator from Ohio, we forget that in the kind of the media hubbub of this, you know, said he's had constituents, you know, more than a handful, 10 yeah. or so, as, as I recall from his statements, who raised these issues. So something's going on there. I don't know what it is. Sure. Uh, but the, the overreaction here, uh, they're more concerned about, um, you know, the idea that someone could be, be complaining about a what I consider to be illegal aliens, I know Biden pretends they're legal by paroling them in, uh, you know, 20,000 people just placed there uh, through the, the uh, basically a, through the sweep of a pen yes. by the Biden administration. And we're not allowed to complain about it and, and the stress that it causes on the community. They want you to That's stop noticing. That's what this is all about, the stress on the community. Yeah, they want they want you to stop noticing. Uh, in fact, back in March, well before CNN was even aware that a town called Springfield, Ohio, existed, uh, the city manager, Ryan Heck, went to uh, one of their uh, regular meetings and had this to say about what he was hearing in the community. And one of the things that, hurt, that I heard that bothered me very much, I've actually had quite a few people contact me here lately, um, is some pretty horrid things occurring to domesticated animals in the neighborhood. Um, we've had some stuff in the park um, that, um, again, they, they're they being taken advantage of for reasons other than, and if you shake your head, Brian. But no, I no, no, I asked, yes. saying, I yes. asked me if there was proof. There okay. is no just proof. don't have proof. And, of, I have, I have, the same and thing. people that have confided in me have asked me for anonymity. I'm not, I can't give their names up. I mean, we haven't seen the proof that you're that you're talking, and I've right. heard I've heard about it. Too. Yeah. Okay, so here you have local officials talking about this very issue in March of last year. I didn't hear Donald Trump's voice among them. That sounded like just local Springfield people having this discussion. Tom Fitton, uh, and it's I think drawing attention to this has really I think shocked a lot of the country when you see twenty thousand foreign nationals have been dropped on a town of fifty eight thousand Americans. Yes, and it's not only in Springfield, Ohio, it's other communities throughout the country. Every town is a border town. When you're importing millions of uh, non-citizens in the course of three or four years, you know they don't go just to one place. They're all over the country, and those numbers have extraordinary impacts on the communities. And you know they don't get the support. And in the case of, of Haiti, what I kind of been educated about that I, I didn't even understand is that these aliens come into the community, they get subsidies from the federal government through NGOs yes. and, other, and other benefits, and uh, there's an incentive by property owners to rent to them in a way that makes it uh, impossible for or increases rents for citizens in the community. So we talk about housing prices, we yes. talk about rents, and we ignore one of the um, uh, forces that are causing rents and housing to rise. Well, and we see it up right up front in, in, in Springfield. And your listeners should look into it. It's pretty remarkable, the testimony and the witness statements and the reporting on yes. it. Yes. And, and one of the other kind of the pieces here that we don't have all the clearest answers on yet is to what extent did the local government officials in Springfield own property that is now being rented uh, by and, and heavily sub subsidized by federal taxpayers. In other words, uh, forget not just Biden and Harris, but what have the what have the leadership in Springfield been doing to their residents? What have, what about Governor Mike DeWine, uh, who has, by the way, he maintains a charity in Haiti. Uh, to what extent is is he a part of the sabotage of his own citizens? I, I think there are a lot of important good governance stories to unwrap here. A million plus people have been moved in by plane or other means through this parole program by Biden. And he initiated it to uh, ease pressure of these folks walking across the border. Yeah. So he just brought them in on planes. And we've never really had that before in American history. The, the, the largest human trafficking operation, I would submit, in human history. Uh, Tom Fitton. Judicial Watch, thank you for always digging in, getting us the answers we need. Thank you, Tom. Good to talk to you today, sir.